Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the special event on European Union and UNDC cooperation to prevent and combat trafficking in person and the smuggling of migrants, introducing blood. This event is organized by the government of Colombia, European Union, and the UNDC Human Trafficking and, and Migrants Smuggling Section. I would like to introduce our panelists this afternoon. Mr. Yuri Fedotov, Executive Director of UNDC, His Excellency Ambassador Lenoir, Head of the European Union Delegation, Ms. Miria Vasilov, European Union and the Trafficking and Coordinator, Ms. Margaret Akulu, Project Coordinator for Global Act. Ladies and gentlemen, before I give the floor to the first panelists, allow me to present some brief remarks. The challenges posed by the crimes of trafficking persons and the smuggling of migrants in a globalized world is, without a doubt, growing and therefore requires a global, coordinated, and effective response. This is easy to say, but achieving it requires great political will and national, regional, and international efforts that allow us to work together in order to face up to the activities of this criminal group, but also to prevent the commission of these crimes and project and assist the victims of the trafficking person and provide necessary support to small migrants. A special attention must be given to women and accompanying migrant children and adolescents. In this context, I wish to highlight the importance of the global action against trafficking persons and the smuggling of migrants globally. This program is sponsored by the European Union and thematically coordinated by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, being implemented in a partnership with the International Organization of Migration on the United Nations Children's Fund whose object and scope will be presented to you today. I would like to outline our general vision to tackle these challenges and the opportunities we are identified so we can work together in the framework of Globe Act. At present, Colombia is part of the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking persons, especially women and children, and in the process of finalizing its internal procedures that in the near future will allow us access the protocol against the smuggling of migrants by land, sea, and air. While we recognize that there can exist strong links between these two crimes, Colombia considers it necessary to maintain a clear differentiation between them, taking into account that these crimes involve different actors and realities. While trafficking persons imply the use of human beings and merchandise with the purpose of exploitation, smuggling of migrants implies enabling the violation of migration regulation of third state foster immigration process, not controlled and not regulated. In this regard, I wish, I wish to highlight the globe in the case of the smuggling of migrants is a tool to strengthen national capacities and in a light in order to build a robust institution that provides comprehensive answers to this phenomenon. A smuggling of migrants is a phenomenon that is significantly growing in our country, due, among other things, to its geographical location, turning into a transit place for a considerable amount of irregular migrants. 
In 2015, our national institution in charge of migration control informed of increased around 320% of cases of irregular migrants, reporting some 8,500 cases. These figures show the increase of the phenomenon in our region. <coughs> in connection with the crime of trafficking persons, the program constitutes another tool to further strengthening existing national developments and stimulating new initiatives. Even though we have robust institutions, we need enhanced assistance for victims of trafficking, strengthen capacities to tackle this phenomenon, not only at the national level, but also at the local level, develop of deep and current cooperation mechanisms with the region, and finally improve our statistics information systems. Finally, I would like to thank the project coordinator, Ms. Margaret Atulo, and her team for the coordinate work that she maintained with the mission of Colombia here in Vienna. At the same time, I reach out the United States office in Bogota to maintain a fluid communication with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the point of contact on national level. Today, we are very pleased to have such high-level panelists, as you can see here on the table. And now, our first speaker is Mr. Yuri Fedotov, Executive Director of the United States. Mr. Fedotov, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. The gentlemen, dear participants, good afternoon. Allow me to begin by thanking Ambassador Cabal San Clemente uh, for his observation regarding the global program, but also for sharing with us experience of Colombia in combating uh, human trafficking and smuggling of migrants. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, according to the Secretary General new report in safety and dignity, there are close to 250 million people on the move globally. For all of the positive effects of international migration, these unprecedented flows of people are generating new criminal opportunities, particularly for migrant smugglers and human traffickers. A joint Europol and Interpol report found that criminal organizations made between five and six billion dollars from smuggling migrants in 2015, with 90% of irregular journeys to Europe facilitated by smugglers. Traffickers exploit <coughs> people without support networks who upon arrival at the destination may face barriers in accessing uh, services and employ employment or uh, justice. At-risk migrants, especially children, have become easy targets for abuse and exploitation, and we continue to witness in Europe and other regions of the world. Clearly, more needs to be done to protect people, to reduce vulnerabilities, enhance protection, and stop the criminals as a part of comprehensive approach to the ongoing refugee crisis and migration challenges. The UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and its Protocols on Migrant Smuggling and Human Trafficking provide a legal framework to address these distinct but often overlapping crimes. However, although the protocols have been ratified by nearly every country in the world, implementation problems remain, and you're familiar with these problems from the regular UNODC global reports on trafficking of persons. Yes, there are challenges with national legal framework with obtaining accurate data and figures and flows with establishing cooperation among different agencies and stakeholders, especially across borders. The continuing crisis makes it even more critical 
that we take steps to address the shortcomings and sharpen criminal justice responses. So, our project with the European Union seeks to do exactly that. The global action to prevent and address trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants is a four-year project supporting 13 strategically selected countries in all continents, Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. It, it, fo it uh, follows a multidisciplinary, right-based, and gender-specific approach centered on the needs and well-being of trafficking victims and smuggled migrants. Implemented by UNODC with uh, IOM and UNICEF, the project seeks to support development of uh, comprehensive strategies and policies tailored to national context. It provides capacity building and technical assistance to ensure that domestic legislative frameworks are in line with international standards and norms and best practice. The project will also have a significant cross-border cooperation <coughs> to strengthen action within and between countries Thank you. and regions for origin, transit, and destination. Law Act built on the achievements, good practices, and lessons learned of our previous project with the European Union. It, is, it also follow, uh, follows on the years of this close cooperation between UNODC and the EU, uh, its anti-trafficking coordinator, and agencies to address human trafficking and migrant smuggling, including through interregional initiatives such as a Khartoum and Rabat processes. Ladies and gentlemen, since the trafficking in persons and the smuggling of migrants protocol came into force a little more than a decade ago, we have made tremendous progress in generating awareness and assistance to address these crimes. The EU has been one of our key donors to contribute significantly fund to, to this effort even as early as 2009, when migrant smuggling received far less attention than it does today. Now, these issues are very clearly on the international agenda, and the importance of countering crimes like human trafficking and smuggling of migrants, promoting justice, and providing protection has been recognized by the Sustainable Development Goals of the ambitious 2030 agenda. You know, this is supporting these comprehensive youth system efforts, including through the Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Persons, known as ICAT, which we're uh, chairing this year. Furthermore, you know, this is a part of a core group of UN agencies working on the preparation and organization of the high-level uh, General Assembly Summit on managing large-scale movement of migrants and refugees to take place on the 19th of September in New York. Finally, we will be presenting the 2016 Global Report on Trafficking in Persons later this year, which I hope will inform further action. I would like to thank the EU partners and once again, in particular, the EU Anti-Trafficking Coordinator Ms. Vasiliadou and Ambassador Lenoir for their long-standing support. We look forward to further strengthening our joint efforts against human trafficking and migrant smuggling. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pelton, for your important statement. And now I would like to invite our, our second speaker, his Excellency Ambassador Lenoir, head of the Europa delegation. We have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let me start by joining you in thanking the Executive Director for his time and spending time in his busy agenda to be with us today. And uh, I'd like also to, to join you in, in thanking uh, the, the project manager for moving this project forward. And thank you personally for hosting and coordinating. It's always a pleasure to, to, to participate in this type of event because I do think this is what gives sense to what we are doing here in Vienna. And from time to time, we're 
because you don't uh, spend a lot of time discussing in new things, discussing in one. But what is important is at the end of the day, we are able to translate this discussion, translate these diplomatic activities into concrete action, concrete realities on the ground. There is a reality beyond the wall of the DIC, there is a reality beyond the wall of our delegation of representation in our offices, and this is what we have to be able to address. And that's the reason why I think this is what makes sense and give a sense to our work. So it's really a pleasure. I'll be I'll be relatively short because I think that um, it is best to have as far as interesting things to say than I would have. But uh, let me make three points. Uh, first one, um, this, this this project is not, I would say, coming out of the blue. It's not, a, we are not starting from scratch. It's, I would say, uh, it describes itself in a, in a long-standing policy in the EU, and it describes itself in a long-standing cooperation with Latin America and with UN agencies. Second point I would like to take on is that uh, uh, it's an important priority uh, for us for quite some time. Uh, it's an important priority for the EU, but I do think that it's also an important priority for, you know, for our partner countries. So, and so, so the important element of this project, and it's, it's a concrete example of implementation of what we call it in, in, in the EU, our support to effective multilateralism, using uh, international organizations, using the international framework provided by international organizations uh, in order to take forward uh, projects that are beneficial to, to, to everybody. Uh, let, let, let me start with, with, with the first point. Um, we have a long-standing and well-established policy in, the, in, in, in this field, and uh, this global action against trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants is, is part of a, a long-standing uh, engagement of the EU. Uh, the fight against migrant smuggling exemplified in what we call the European Agenda on Migration as a Priority for the EU. And uh, EU legislation to counter migrant smuggling has been developed over the years and is in place since 2002. It is obviously currently re-evaluated to take into account uh, the evolution of, of the phenomenon. And we are permanently assessing it to, to, to see whether it's still fit for purpose. But, but, but we have a long-standing policy and a long-standing framework. Uh, as part of this permanent uh, reassessing process, uh, we have adopted last year a new action plan against migrant smuggling for 2015-2020. And this is where you would find a, a comprehensive policy framework uh, based on a number of few key principles, such as a multidisciplinary approach to the problem, uh, aiming at boosting practical cooperation uh, between member states, uh, engaging with uh, international organizations uh, and, and, and uh, other uh, relevant players. This, this, this five-year plan uh, revolves around four priorities. We should enhance information exchange, we should improve prosecution and investigation, we should cooperate with existing partner countries, uh, and we should address the question of prevention uh, of smuggling, including assistance to vulnerable persons. So, again, uh, this is not coming out of the blue. This is not something that we have developed over the past uh, months. Uh, I would say the crash move to, to face uh, uh, new challenges. This is a long standing uh, policy, this is a long term engagement, and uh, this will remain to be a long term engagement. The second key element that I wanted to make, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon is a key priority for the EU, but we do think that it's not only a key priority for the EU, it should be a key priority for the international community and for our partner countries as well. Uh, if you look at uh, migrant smuggling, it's, it's a highly profitable activity, unfortunately. A uh, lot of money to be made, and a perceived low risk of detection of this. And this is what we want to change. If we want to address the phenomenon, you have to change this sort of risk benefit analysis that is made by criminal, and we change it by decreasing the benefit and decreasing the risk. And this is what we are trying to do. 
it's important uh, for us, obviously, but it's important for partner countries because out of these renewable activities, uh, a, a number of uh, massive uh, benefits are made. Uh, I think we don't have precise figures, but uh, it's probably in the billions that we are talking. Um, and this, uh, this model uh, is used to feed other renewable activities, so it's important that we should circle the best in this stuff. So uh, that is uh, one of the key reasons why uh, we want, uh, we are very pleased to be able to engage, uh, we have been engaging for quite some time with partners on, on this type of issue. Uh, third, third key point, uh, we think that the best way to, to take forward this, 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 this project is to use uh, uh, the expertise we have here. And uh, for that we have uh, a number of uh, Organization, UNODC, obviously, first and foremost, but also the, the, the International Organization for Migration or UNICEF that are very helpful. We do think that's the way uh, you push forward uh, the effective multilateralism I was talking about. It's by demonstrating, using, using expertise where it is, so that, and, and beyond the expertise, also using this sort of framework that is provided by this organization to actually go beyond sort of the bilateral way. Issues or to address issues, but, but, but go beyond that and actually get the international community as a whole engaged to solve issues that are common to, to, to all of us. Um, this cooperation with, with this organization is also long, long been successful, uh, particularly in the field of combating trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. Uh, the UNODC has already been contributing to, to, to the, is contributing to the development of our key policy document. UNODC uh, has been implementing already a number of, of, of very important projects for us. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we were about to celebrate the 10th anniversary of uh, uh, form, formalization of, of, of our relationship with UNODC and also the cooperation is obviously uh, holding in that. So uh, we do think that the, the role of UNODC in addressing trafficking and human being and migrant smuggling cannot be overstated. UNODC is a one of the uh, UN Convention against uh, transnational organized crime uh, and its work in combating, in combating organized crime is extensive. So uh, we are very much pleased to be able to once again uh, conduct a project with, with, with UNODC. I think I'll, 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 I'll stop there with, with these three key principles. Uh, this is something important for the EU that has to be addressed in the long term. This is something that cannot be addressed by you alone, but we want to address it with partners, and this is something that we want to address in a multilateral uh, framework, because uh, we want to use the, the expertise uh, that exists. This is an issue that is complex, it's multidimensional, uh, it's increasingly urgent, and uh, that, that makes it even more important to, to, to fully implement these three key principles that I was mentioning. With that, uh, as a favor, I think uh, I'll let Madame Fassinelli to, to give you more information on the solutions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Benoit. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, to our next speaker, Ms. Fassinelli, the European Union Trafficking Coordinator. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Chair, and of course, the Government of uh, Colombia, the Executive Director of the UNODC, our close partners, Excellencies, Ambassador uh, Lenoir. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, panel of distinguished guests on the cooperation between the EU and the UNODC to prevent and combat trafficking of human beings and smuggling of migrants. It's actually very good to see this global EU UNODC project uh, being introduced in this context. Uh, I just want to highlight that this project is expected to contribute to the implementation of the EU strategy towards the eradication of trafficking in human beings. Uh, as I said, together with the UNODC, the IOM, UNICEF, long-standing long trusted partners in our joint efforts. Our cooperation, of course, with UNODC dates back in time and it's a strategic one. And I cannot stress enough what Ambassador Lenoir said that 
it is only in unity that we can respond to the challenges that we have ahead. The European Union, but also the world, is experiencing challenging times, and 2016 is a decisive year in this context. Amidst the refugee crisis, more people become vulnerable to traffickers who want to use them for profits, and this must stop. Cross-border crimes become even more interlinked. Indeed, uh, we know from the report, we know from Europol, we know from Interpol, that trafficking in human beings is often linked with migrant smuggling, child sexual exploitation, drug trafficking, cybercrime, terrorism. It's a very long list. Clearly, these are challenges that we cannot address alone. No country can address alone. We need a collective effort, we need to work together. The EU and the UNODC have been working together in addressing trafficking since 2007. And I think with this new project, we're entering a new phase in our cooperation. And we're bringing in more partners, focus on children, the role of civil society. And some, some people think I can become repetitive, but I think it's important when we talk about these things to remember that we're talking about real people and real people's lives. When we talk about trafficking human beings, we're talking about the buying and selling of people in today's world. We buy and sell women, men, children. It is the abuse of people as commodities. Again, we need to remember that. It's a severe form of organized crime that is explicitly referred to in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I'm proud that amidst this, this dire, these horrible times, the EU continues to promote globally higher standards. I think this is very much acknowledged in addressing trafficking in line with our comprehensive uh, legal and policy framework. And what do we do? We put centers at the victim. We, uh, at the, we put victims at the center. I'm very sorry. We put human rights at the center. We are gender specific and we take a very child sensitive approach. And these are not words, these are stipulated in the law and in the policy and translated in part funding. Uh, trafficking remains very high on the political agenda. It is part of the uh, European migration agenda, the European agenda on security, on the human rights and democracy action plan, on the new gender action plan. We take a very comprehensive approach and our commitment continues. As you know, the EU remains the world's largest aid donor. I'm pleased to see that our strategic cooperation with the UNODC, with the IOM, with UNICEF, continues now with this 10.5 million euro project, complementing an ongoing 10.5 million project uh, implemented by the International Federation of the Red Cross. And we look forward to do that, to continue this cooperation in a constructive spirit. We need to foster complementarities. We need to eliminate obligations that is equally important. And we need to maximize impact of the EU funding. So I know that we all look forward to seeing concrete results and impact. In the last decade, the EU funded through its uh, different external instruments over 100 projects on human trafficking. We have recently launched a study that will deliver a comprehensive policy review of projects funded by the European Commission. So what do we do? We uh, map the geographical areas, the fields, the different actors, the different types of projects. We do an analysis of their outcomes and recommendations. And why do we do all that? We need to understand where we've been in order to know where to go to next. We are going to be shaping a new strategy, uh, a new policy framework at the end of this year, and we need to know exactly what it is we need to be doing next. I would like to share with you a very recent development on the 19th of May, so last week, uh, uh, myself, together with the Commissioner for Migration, Home Affairs and Citizenship, Mr. Avramopoulos, um, in a joint press conference, we presented a landmark report, the first progress report on EU efforts to address trafficking in human beings. This is a milestone in our joint efforts, and I'm very, uh, I'm very honored that the media throughout the world was able to report on the work that is being done at the EU level. We take stock of progress made, we acknowledge efforts to identify needs in areas uh, for further action, all based on data by the EU member states and civil society and international and regional bodies. I see this as an exercise of accountability and collective effort. And what do we know?
Some people say we know the tip of the iceberg. I know we don't know the whole story. We know that we have at least 16,000 uh, people who were registered, so only the ones registered, in the EU in 2013 and 14. A staggering 80% of them are women and children. The rest uh, are men. What is very interesting as well is that 65% of them are EU citizens. This is consistent with what Eurostat has told us time and time again, what the UNODC data um, uh, also shows, and other organizations. We do feel that the numbers are very, very much higher. Two and a half thousand child victims were identified. Trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation is by far the most prevalent form registered, with more than two thirds of the victims. And out of those, almost all are women, are women and girls, 95%. We have 21% trafficking for labor exploitation, but I want to read to you the remaining 12%. I think I, I'd like to read the list of what the 12 remaining percent is to, to remember what we're referring to. Trafficking for the purpose of false begging. Trafficking for the purpose of criminal activity. Forced marriage, child marriage, organ removal. Trafficking of infants and young children for adoption. Trafficking of pregnant women to sell their newborn babies. Trafficking for drug smuggling or the selling of drugs. These are the realities of people while we're sitting in this room. The report shows some very worrying trends that criminal networks are exploiting the current migration crisis and targeting the most vulnerable migrants, in particular women and children. The top five EU countries of registered victims were Romania, Bulgaria, the Netherlands, Hungary, and Poland. This was the, sa this was the same countries as for the previous year that we had from Eurostat. Whereas from the, outside the, the EU, the non-EU countries, we have Nigeria consistently there, China, Albania, Vietnam, and Morocco. What we also recognize in the report, and this very much echoes the UN, the UNODC's concerns, is the, that trafficking in human beings is usually linked to organized crime. In the current context of the migrant crisis, I think this is extremely relevant. We see an increase in victims arriving from Libya the IOM alone reported nearly 5,000 women and girls from Nigeria being trafficked into, uh, into the EU within the context of the migrant crisis, predominantly for the purpose of sexual exploitation. What Europol says is that the economic crisis influences demand that fosters of online exploitation. But we also do positive, we see positive steps. We see more progress in ensuring victims have access to rights. We see more cooperation at all levels between government authorities and civil society. We see increased use of joint investigation teams, better work to ensure prevention of the crime, uh, to bridge gaps in legislative actions. At the same time, we see uh, areas that need a lot of improvement, a very worrying level of prosecution and convictions, very low. Many victims of trafficking still not properly identified. I actually met people who said to me, I am not part of the statistics. And if I met them, I know there's a lot more out there. We need to do a lot more to prevent the crime, including measures to reduce the demand. And in particular, regard to the use of services of the victims of trafficking, just only half of the member states treat it as a crime. So we have many challenges, but we also have the tools available in order to address them. I would like us to go beyond the convenient way out of suggesting that trafficking in human beings happens because of poverty, conflict, war, and gender inequality. Unfortunately, we know we cannot eradicate all this in the next year or in the next decade. It's very unfortunate, but it's very true. It is also very true that if you're poor, it doesn't mean you will be trafficked. You will be trafficked because someone exploits you, somebody demands your services one way or another, somebody buys you and sells you, and most importantly, somebody makes profit. If we want to address trafficking, then we need to answer questions. Who profits from the exploitation of others? Who benefits from cheap products and services? What are we doing to ensure that we sufficiently target the criminals, but also the users and the profit makers? 
who buys the services of victims, sometimes knowingly, sometimes not, who keeps slaves in their hands, but very crucially, we need to answer only one question. How do the astronomical profits fuel the demand for the use of services of the victims? When I talk about astronomical profits, Europol gives us a very conservative estimate of 25 billion euros. The ILO, in the broader context of forced labor, puts the number up to 150 billion. We're talking about one of the top most profitable organized forms of criminality in the world. And the EuroBC knows this better. So in my capacity uh, as the anti-trafficking coordinator and the commission, we will continue to support the member states in their efforts to work towards achieving uh, our objective of zero tolerance, of working towards the eradication of trafficking. And we count on the UNODC and on all our international partners to work, to work together in this direction. Within the context also of achieving the, the 2030 Sustainable uh, Development Goals and via bilateral relations. We already work in that in the EU. Uh, we raise trafficking in the framework of human rights dialogues with 40 countries. As I said, the action plan of human rights and democracies and a lot more. We need to address this in a comprehensive manner, multiple levels, at the European level, at the national level, at the global level, international level, but also at the local level. We need to work with the public and private and the non-governmental sector. We need to do this comprehensively. I want to close once more by repeating. We cannot address trafficking, and the EU is clear, the EU Commissioner uh, on, on uh, Migration and, and Home Affairs is clear, I am clear, without following the money and without addressing the demand for all forms of exploitation. We need conceptual clarity, because language matters, and this project is about ensuring that as well. We need to remember that trafficking and smuggling are not the same thing. There are strong links, but they are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. Trafficking and slavery are not the same phenomenon. And while it's very convenient to talk about terms left, right, center, and politically sounds nice, let me remind you that we have different legal instruments and obligations in place that matter a great deal because it is, a, it is in accordance with legal definitions that someone is punished, not according to political language. When we have a crime, we need a legal definition. We need definitions, they're important because only when we define the problem we can solve it. Only when we're clear about legal definitions can we properly support and protect the victims. And I will insist that upholding and promoting the standards set by the UN, by WIMPOC and its protocols are paramount and of paramount importance to the EU. Trafficking in human beings is not some modern term, a trend that we just choose to talk about. It existed before the current migration context and unfortunately it exists where we allow it to flourish, where we allow the profits to maximize, and where our demand for services and cheap labor fosters it. We are now working in this context on a new post-2016 strategy, a new policy framework at the EU level. Um, the current strategy comes to an end at the end of the year. As I said, GLOAC is part of this strategy and we're very proud to be working in this direction. We will put victims' fundamental rights at the center. We will continue doing that. We have a very important momentum at the EU with the directive we have in place. It is now high time we implement what we have promised to do. And the EU, myself, we commit very much to supporting the member states in their efforts and commit to working with the UNODC and we very, very much look forward to renewing collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madame Wasiadou, for your interesting presentation and point of view. And now, in order to close these high-level panelists, I would like to invite to take the floor Ms. Margaret Akulo, that she is the project coordinator of GLOAT, and really the heart of the project. We have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. Just want to acknowledge the distinguished panelists, representatives of the diplomatic community, UN agencies, representatives of civil society, and the audience listening and watching uh, via our live stream. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 
I'm honored to be part of this high level panel and to be afforded the opportunity to provide you with an overview of Glow Act. My presentation is in three parts. And I, for this um, presentation or for this slide, I will perhaps be sort of talking project management language, the inception phase. It's a phase where we began to determine an overall vision for the project, including the scope of the project, its boundaries, and importantly, to identify countries and key stakeholders to work with on the project. The second part of the presentation, I will provide you with activities that we've undertaken in the implementation phase. And this is where, in this phase, the visions and plans become reality. We follow the plan we put together and mitigate any challenges that come up. Words like outcomes, deliverables, activities start to mean things that the project delivers. And finally, the current phase of consultation. So what is GLOW Act? GLOW Act is derived from the word global action and is a global action against trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. It's a four-year initiative, as we've heard, between the EU and UNODC being implemented in partnership with IOM and UNICEF. And GLOW Act builds on more than 10 years of EU-UNODC partnership and is a further addition to a number of UNODC projects that have been funded by the EU. As Mr. Federer piloted, GLOW Act builds on previous achievements as well as good practices and lessons learned of previous UNODC projects co-funded by the EU. GLOW Act is expected to be delivered in 13 countries selected across Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America, focusing on assistance to governmental authorities, civil society organizations, victims of trafficking, and smuggled migrants. GLOWAC will work with selected countries in developing and implementing comprehensive national counter-trafficking and counter smuggling responses, ensuring that a dual prevention and protection approach has been adopted. In this respect, there are six key responses or levels of intervention being applied within the project, and they cover strategy and policy development, legislative assistance, capacity building, regional and trans regional cooperation protection and assistance to victims of trafficking and smuggled migrants and assistance and support to children among victims of trafficking and smuggled migrants. We are now into 10 months into the project since Mr. Fedotov announced the project in July together with Ms. Mogherini, who is the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security <coughs> Policy and Vice President of the Commission at a high-level meeting in Brussels. From then till December 2015, focus was placed in hiring a core project team, formalizing partnerships with IOM and UNICEF, but importantly, engaging with countries engaging with the Vienna and Geneva-based permanent missions on project scope. The project was officially launched in Brussels by the EU this year in January with a keynote delivered by Ms. Maria Faciliadu, the EU anti-trafficking coordinator. As the project has evolved, we have engaged extensively with our UNODC colleagues and externally with our partners we have provided regular updates to key stakeholders, developed a web page, and soon we will circulate the first issue of the Glow Up newsletter, marking one year since you had signed the agreement with the EU. This approach has ensured that we have drawn on the expertise of various people and organizations. 
Importantly, we have developed two assessment instruments as a result of an expert group meeting, which was held here in Vienna in March. A questionnaire and a report outline that is currently being used <coughs> by a team of consultants to assess the needs of countries, to assess the situation on the ground with regard to effectively responding to the two crimes of trafficking and smuggling. So where are we now? We're halfway through a gaps and needs assessment process set to conclude in September. 50 missions are currently being undertaken in the 13 countries, which started at the end of March and will conclude in the middle of June. The purpose of these in-country assessments and missions are to introduce GLOW Act to national authorities and to gain an understanding of each country's response to trafficking and smuggling. The ultimate aim is that we jointly, with government authorities and key stakeholders, develop work plans to assist in effectively responding to trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. One lead consultant and seven specialized consultants have been hired to work under the the direction of the GLOW Act project team to produce the assessment report and initial findings. Each needs assessment mission is comprised of a consultant and the needs and supported by staff from the human trafficking and migrant smuggling section. Support to the missions is also provided by our network of field officers who have helped develop the agenda and arrange meetings in consultation with the government and key authorities of countries. The consultative missions cover four continents, 13 countries, over a 12 week period. We're more than halfway through this process with eight missions completed and five scheduled over the next few weeks. In some cases, we've had meetings or had two missions per country. Part of the mission has uh, been meeting or having meetings, uh, four to five meetings a day over a five day period. We've met with government counterparts, national inter-institutional committees on trafficking and smuggling, various law enforcement agencies, training institutions, victim support services, including civil society, and also with representatives from the EU, IOM, and UNICEF. This work has generated a lot of useful information, knowledge, and has helped us gain an understanding of the situation in the countries and on the ground. We have drawn on previous work, ongoing programs, and been guided by our field officers who also have first-hand knowledge of the situation on the ground. We haven't done this work alone. This has also been possible because of the enormous support from other parts of the UNODC House. The core team funded by GLOW Act is to the left of the slide and consists of four staff based in Vienna within the human trafficking and migrant smuggling section. The project receives valuable support and guidance from all the team, the second column, which is a human trafficking migrant smuggling section uh, made up of our chief of section, section managers, the crime prevention and criminal justice officers, associate experts, monitoring and evaluation officer, program and administrative assistants. Other in-house support, divisions, branches, <coughs> sections, network of field officers I've mentioned, listed in the last two columns of the slide, they too have been invaluable in this process and will continue to do so over the course um, of the project. Initial findings are indicating the need for advisors or mentors on the ground in country. And so we will begin recruiting nationals, one each in the 13 countries, to work with the government authorities in the selected countries from July 2016. So what happened next from June 2016, which is next month. We have a tight timetable to finalize all 13 reports 
by the end of August. Prior to that, we will be presenting draft findings uh, to the EU at our project steering committee meeting at the end of June. We will also present the reports to governments for their review and validation with the hope of working to finalise a work plan for the implementation of GLOW Act activities. Whilst the consultations are ongoing, we have also, in parallel, begun delivering on activities related to the outcomes of GLOW Act. For example, in Bishkek last week, a three-day focus group workshop was organised by our field office and section colleagues examining the six outcomes of the project, results of which have provided strategic guidance on the way forward. In South Africa, two of the global programs, one being GLOW Act and the other the global program on smuggling of migrants, supported a regional dialogue on smuggling of migrants protocol and on finalizing a regional strategy to formulate priority actions to be considered in a draft action plan against the smuggling of migrants. A very encouraging meeting organized by our office in South Africa and it was attended uh, by 11 out of the 15 member states of the South African development community. I also want to share with you examples of GLOW Act activities, which is to the right of the slide, being planned for the next quarter, July to September, based on our initial meetings and at the request of countries. These include awareness raising exercises on tracking and tackling, training on disruption of illicit financial flows, training on investigating sexual exploitation of children, training to social workers, health and criminal justice officials, training to parliamentarians. What has been perspective? over the last few months. We've had 100 plus meetings over 12 weeks in an attempt to get a perspective. What are we finding? And we've already sort of heard um, some of sort of similar findings. Legal frameworks that need strengthening, low levels of criminalization, low levels of implementation of the protocols, definitional problems, a lack of focus on criminal networks and smugglers, lack of accurate data, but we're also finding political will and commitment to address the issue. Ongoing cooperation, the work of previous programs that Glow Up will build on, ongoing programs that Glow Up will complement. The last picture is the thumbnail of victims, the youngest being eight, this is an example of children sexually exploited who are provided with victim support services by NGOs and civil society. And as Mr. Belatov said, our work is centered also on the needs and well-being of victims. The question is, what do we aim to achieve at the end of the project in July 2019? We hope that we would continue building on the good work of existing programs and continue to work with countries, giving guidance on key elements for an effective response to human trafficking and migrant smuggling. We hope, for example, that the number of cases investigated and prosecuted will increase, traffic victims, smuggled migrants and other vulnerable migrants identified will be assisted by government authorities and civil society organizations. That legal reform, reviews, amendments, policies, and strategies will be developed by countries to meet international standards. And that knowledge and skills will be enhanced through capacity building activities of criminal justice practitioners and other relevant actors. Better outcomes through awareness raising to criminal justice officials, social and health sector officials, and specific population groups will be realized. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude by 
extending my appreciation to colleagues within the human trafficking and migrant smuggling section and to the other UNODC colleagues, to our partners, IOM and UNICEF, and to the EU. We do value the contributions, expert knowledge, and guidance so far. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the officials from the permanent missions and representatives from the countries and the Globe Act who have been very much a part of this process. Thank you, Your Excellency Ambassador Sacramenti, and also our distinguished panelists for moderating uh, this session. We look forward to continuing this uh, important work. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Margaret Ulo, for your completely presentation of the program. And now I would like to open the floor. Uh, if somebody or you have some questions, please feel free to do it. Any, any panelist. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador Sacramento, and also all the distinguished panelists. Today for their respective presentations, let me mention that I represent Ukraine on this occasion. So I will allow to make a few remarks and I will follow up on the discussion. Let me express appreciation of to all the stakeholders for launching this initiative, Global Action Against Trafficking in Persons and the Smuggling of Migrants. Welcome to project design and the scopeless areas of support in the fields of strategy and policy development, legislative assistance, capacity building regional and trans-regional cooperation, protection and assistance for victims of trafficking and smuggling migrants, in particular the most vulnerable groups. Human trafficking and smuggling and smuggling of migrants remains an acute problem for Ukraine, aggravated by massive internal migration flows fueled by the ongoing conflict in, in Donbass. Ukraine is a party to all the key international legal instruments in these fields. In 2011, social program of countering trafficking in persons. Uh, we are confident that the work will be instrumental in assisting governments to implement the victims and the relevant international legal instruments and comprehensive national counter trafficking and counter smuggling strategies. The assessment mission under the project has already been undertaken in Ukraine. The focal point uh, has been established and we offer our full preparation for the successful this project in Ukraine. Finally, let me express gratitude for selecting Ukraine as one of the beneficiary countries. Thank all the stakeholders involved in preparing and delivering the project, and in particular the European Union, for generous financial support of the GWAC initiative. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your words. I don't know if so any of our panelists have a Want to comment something? Yes, okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, also, some more questions? Ah, yes. and the fact that the directive asks uh, EU countries to, to, to take measures to reduce the demand. And I just want to draw the attention of the fact that my country, France, has just adopted a new law to fight against uh, uh, the prostitution system and sexual exploitation. This law strengthens the tools to investigate and prosecute uh, kidnapping and sexual exploitation. Um, and in order to discourage the demand, this law creates a new Additionally, this will provide assistance to get 
help from prostitution to those who are in, to get out of prostitution. And we are therefore implementing the relevant uh, provision of the directive uh, about uh, uh, human development. Um, my second point is a question. Um, we know that uh, very often uh, THP has been uh, mixed with uh, trafficking human beings. We know there are some mix between the two phenomena. But do we have an estimate of the percentage of people, uh, migrants, uh, that being attracted by this work force? The first thing to say is that what we recognize is that sometimes uh, criminals abuse uh, the vulnerability of victim, uh, of, of uh, people who are smuggled uh, continue exploiting and therefore uh, becoming victims of trafficking. In terms of numbers, the only thing I can do is point you to what we also looked at, uh, the Europol Interpol latest report from May 2016. And I read what you would read, and yes, uh, and it indicates that about 20% of the smugglers are also involved in human trafficking. Uh, in terms of victims, I think we all need to do a lot more to ensure that, uh, that possible victims of trafficking or victims of trafficking are identified, especially at the hotspots. We need to use this, appro uh, this approach to better identify victims. But do we have actual numbers? No. But I think it's a very, very challenging task at the moment uh, to do so. Uh, we need to uh, improve our efforts. I think we'll ask him as well. One more question? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I represent Belarus here at the United Nations. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this event, which would popularize the program just well, uh, which we are well aware of uh, being a beneficiary country. Uh, as some of you probably know, Belarus has been quite active in the anti-human trafficking activity. More than 10 years ago, we initiated global climate action in the United Nations against human trafficking. Since then, we sponsored a number of resolutions in the General Assembly, as well as some uh, topical ones here in the framework of the Society Session. And we also created quite uh, extensive national program, I would say, to combat this crime of human trafficking. At the same time, we are, we are very much grateful to the initiators of the program for selecting us as a beneficiary country. We do hope that this would give us new dimension and new impetus. Uh, one of the possible fields is practically broadening our national activities to have more measures uh, targeted on the migration side of this issue and to ensure our practitioners from the Ministry of Interior and other relevant organizations would be ready to work on this and we are looking forward to the mission to the country that would uh, happen quite soon, I think next week it should start. Uh, so we are looking forward to this kind of work. And my question is, I have noticed from the presentation given to Leon Thomas before that the GLOW Act would also have regional component. Could you please elaborate a little more uh, how would you see the development of this regional cooperation as a result of this uh, maybe first interactions with the countries? What kind of concrete measures would you plan? Uh, uh, would you also think of using the existing capabilities of the countries like Belarus uh, to broaden the scope of regional cooperation and would you be considering holding the events in the beneficiary countries involving the neighbors? Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment and question. Thank you very, very happy. Thank you very much, uh, representative from Belarus. And we've had um, extensive discussions. Um, in answer to your question, Article 4 is on regional and trans regional cooperation. And uh, part of the assessment, we are hoping that we can actually identify um, either existing initiatives that have a regional impact that would be part of that assessment and part of the recommendations 
Uh, one of the reasons for selecting countries is also about their regional, um, their work within the regional and engagement with regional partners. So in answer to your question, yes, there will be an opportunity not just to work nationally, but also to engage neighboring countries in addressing the issue. And we do hope that that comes out um, in the assessment reports and our discussions with government and policy. Okay. Well, uh, no more questions. So thank you very much for, to all of you for coming to this side event. And once again, my gratitude to our panelists for being here today. Thank you very much.